Uh, sure, yeah. So uh, I'm John Hawes. Um, I've been involved in anti-malware testing for more than 20 years now um, in various roles. I've, I've been on the vendor side. I've been with independent test labs. Uh, my main gig the last five years now uh, has been running the anti-malware testing standards organization, um, which is a, a non-profit promoting better testing, basically. Um, yeah, that's me. Well, actually, I was always interested as a kid. Um, my my dad was a primary school teacher, and he was the, the one who he, he did all the science side of things. So he got to bring home cool stuff during the school holidays because you know it's much safer at someone's house than in an empty school. So we had you know one year we one summer we had a VCR, which was really exciting, except we only had one tape. Um, but then a couple of holidays we had a, a BBC computer, which was great, and I loved that. Mainly mainly playing games on it, obviously the you know tanks shooting over mountains and that kind of thing but uh, but also they had a a turtle did you ever play with the turtle it was like it was like a, a perspex dome with wheels and like a big really fat ribbon cable connecting it to the bbc and you could basically program into it and be like you know go forward six turn right 90 drop pen draw a picture on paper pick up pen turn right that kind of thing and you could basically program it you type in a string of stuff and say go and see if you got it right, basically. Which I that was I guess that was my kind of first introduction to what computers could do. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't. It was very different because you're always doing it on a carpet as well. So a piece of paper on a carpet is never a good thing to draw on. Yeah, and stab holes in it and stuff. But um, but yeah, that was I guess that was my 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 first introduction, and then from there on, like you know, ZX Spectrums, little rubber keypad, and that kind of thing, and then yeah, then kind of got out of it for a while. I guess I was kind of playing football and girls and alcohol and stuff like that, and then didn't really use computers at all until after university, and then just kind of accidentally really staggered back into it. No, no, and I, and so this would have been well, the mid '90s, and it was the time the kind of internet and email was all kind of taking off. But I don't know, I was I was far too busy with other things, so I wasn't paying much attention to that at all. And uh, yeah, it wasn't until after university, and I you know needed a job, went to a temp agency and did a string of uh, sort of two three month contracts and various things. I worked in a company making precision instruments like. Um, particle beam splitters and space mirrors and things like that. And I worked in their, their archive room, basically building a database of all their old blueprints of all this weird stuff, which was really fun, like going through these random boxes and going, what is this? And putting it in a database, which they would then use to find anything or anything. If I had to rebuild the Hubble Space Telescope or something, they'd have the, the blueprints for the mirrors that they built there. But um, yeah, somehow that that qualified me as computer guy. So then when I went back to temp agency, they were like, oh, we've got another company. It's a record shop. They need a database doing. So yeah, I did that and then ended up at a company doing um, educational computers, both hardware and software. And I was I was testing their school software, which was, you know, like it was fairly informal, but it was like taking a, a kind of souped up version of paint with big friendly buttons for kids and just playing with it as hard as you could and trying to break it basically like you know drawing the most complicated picture you could using every paintbrush and every color and every other feature and all in one canvas and then seeing if it would explode so that was uh, that was my introduction to testing i guess um i i got pretty good at some of the some of the tools were pretty pretty advanced so yeah there was uh, there, there was a guy who sat next to me who was doing like photorealistic pictures of his his like computer set up his desk basically he's just drawing it on screen pixel by pixel over several months and I was like, i'm not sure you're actually testing it out that thoroughly there but it's a great picture <laughs> yeah yeah but it was it wasn't just it wasn't just paint obviously there was all kinds of 
different software that they provided for schools that, uh, we, and and you know a little bit of security stuff as well you know sort of locking down the system so that kids couldn't access stuff they shouldn't do so that was i guess my first introduction to to security as well was trying to break that stuff um again entirely by accident um i was talking to a guy in the pub it was i think it was about my then partner's work drinks thing and i was at the girlfriend girlfriends and boyfriends table i was chatting to this guy and he was like hey the company i'm i'm working for is need some testers do you want to come and get a proper job and i was like okay so i went and uh, joined this company and i was there five years testing their antivirus products and the kind of it was um release testing so it wasn't the sort of incremental qa that goes on while products are being developed it was this, the monthly cycle of it was back in the day when you know your your updates for your antivirus still came in the post on a floppy disk, or moving into CDs by then, I guess. But um, yeah, it was, and every build that went out had to be thoroughly tested against a, a full set of, of QA procedures that we had there, including I think certainly in the early days, scanning every known sample of malware in existence, which. Um, was was doable for a year or two, but by, I guess, yeah, early two thousands, it really started ticking up. I think at the time it was sort of a few a few tens of thousands, and then suddenly there's a few hundred thousand, and then we're looking at I don't even know what it is today. It's like millions per month coming out. So it's, that would be completely unmanageable these days. But um, but uh, yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was even then it was it was that was the main focus of the work really was kind of building up the cap capacity to be able to do that. That you know, a build comes out, you want to get it out the door as quickly as possible. You don't want to sit there waiting while this machine chugs through hundreds of thousands of samples to detect. So you you know, distributing it, speeding up the machines, that kind of thing. So that was quite uh, quite interesting work as well. And also we were working on lots of different platforms because the, the, the company supported dozens of versions of Linux and Unix and really obscure stuff like um, old OS2 and open VMS and things like that and that was for some reason that became my specialty area I was I was the non Windows guy and non Windows included everything apart from Windows and Mac for some reason so uh, yeah I got to play with with AIX and HPUX and Solaris and all these things, which was yeah, fun times. Yeah, and the, the pain in the ass ones to play with as well. Netware, always hated netware. Oh my god. <laughs> Don't go there. Don't bring them up. Yeah, yes. Well, it's it's it, it is different. Although we do occasionally get emails from we have people saying, "I'm suing you because you've published pictures of my daughter without her permission." And we politely email back saying, "I don't think you've got the right TikTok." Yeah, but uh, no, TikTok's been going. Well, our our TikTok social has been going for probably almost ten years now. My wife set it up originally. Um, she she's also in the security industry and she she left her she was working for one of the big big security firms and branched out to set up on her own and she set up TikTok to do that from um she does a lot of consultancy work writing that kind of thing but uh well, most importantly she she runs the uh smashing security podcast which is um part of what we do at TikTok and uh, yeah then when I decided to, to go it alone as well, which was five years ago now, I, I basically became a, a co-director at the, the company. So we, we work together, we kind of share admin tasks, although somehow I end up doing most of the uh, invoicing and financial bits like that, because she, she finds, uh, I guess so. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I am I'm unofficial CTO as well. So I, I'm always called in to uh, fix any computer issues, which 
can be tricky. I'm not really a Mac person, and she's a very Mac person. So she's like, well, how do I do this on a Mac? And I'm like, I don't know. Can we open a terminal? No, I usually, I usually, I usually resort to uh, old Unix commands. I'm like, well, it's under here somewhere, so surely I can find it. Mostly works. Um, well, obviously, my my current gig at uh, at Ampso is is done through I'm a, as a consultant for, for via TikTok Social. Um, I do a bit of writing stuff on the side. That was another string to my bow a while ago. I I did a few years writing for the Naked Security blog, which was uh, which was quite big back in the day. Um, I think three or four years I worked for them, and that was that was quite fun as well. Sort of. Finding interesting stories in the in the security space, so it meant you you can't keep up with all the news. That's everything big that's going on, but you're also kind of squirreling down and trying to find the the weird stuff that no one else has reported yet, or that might be of particular niche interest to your audience, but hasn't really been big enough to make it in any of the bigger outlets. And uh, and then also on the other other side, kind of taking whatever big stories have come out and kind of giving them an interesting spin. That's kind of an, think pieces on them which is very enjoyable and uh, and yeah I like writing so I, I try and keep that up I try and have a few side gigs going because because it helps to keep on top of the news and you know, get a bit of money out of it as well and I get to practice my writing which you know you gotta you gotta keep uh, keep warm Um, oh, I was just, I was reminded of one the other day. There was, uh, do you know what, do you know the term 420? It's a, a reference to marijuana, apparently, in America. Yeah, and there was there was a great one where there was a, uh, I think it was a hotel or something in uh, in Nigeria, and someone complained about the smell of marijuana coming out of this, this uh, cabin, I guess it was, or a hotel room. And so the police raided, and they found inside a major 419 scam operation. The excellent headline came for a 420, you got a 419. Yeah, you'd think, right? You'd be more careful. If, you, if you're doing a big scam, don't, don't make a big stink. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I did another one. I can't remember what it was about. It was something to do with the US military, though. Some there was some, I don't know, flaw in their army computer login system that was easily bypassable or something. So I just wrote this kind of throwaway story on it. But I guess it got kind of passed to, to, to some army forum. And then suddenly the next thing I knew, it had a million hits. And I was like, whoa, that's that's rather a lot. Because I, I, I expect my average story was more like 10,000 or something at most. Yeah, exactly. But only with a very specific audience of uh, angry American men. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Um, mainly talking to people, to be honest, um, in, in my, my current role and in fact in my previous one as well at uh, Virus Bulletin, there was a lot of, of interaction with people all over the industry, certainly the, the, the vendor side, the security companies, you know, have to work with them on a daily basis and it's mainly the engineers that I tend to work with. So they, um, they like to gossip and they say, did you see this that happened to that other company? Yes. Well, Slightly, but tell me all about it. So you kind of get uh, all the all the kind of inside secrets, which is kind of nice. It's like being in the uh, in the smoking area in a big office. You kind of hear about what's going on in all the other departments that no one else hears about. Yes. So I moved there from 
the so the, the QA role I was I was at uh, Sophos, um, and BB is has a kind of connection to Sophos. There's like I think they call them sister companies or something or used to be. They certainly have the same founders, um, and the the guy who ran the VB testing side used a corner of our test lab for years and uh, for, for a while was actually my upstairs neighbor as well and we were, we were always like who who is this guy yeah exactly yeah um uh, yeah but I didn't really know who he was for for the first year or two but eventually got to know him and figured out what was going on and it was, I was like oh, this is kind of interesting and then when he left they were like um we need someone that can take over this job and I was like Sounds like I could probably do it, I reckon. It's kind of similar to what I've been doing the last four or five years at Sophos. So, yeah, I, I went and did that, and I, I ran the BB100 certification program for 10 years or so. And the last two or three years, I was helping run the company as well. So that was, uh, yeah, quite, quite fun stuff. I also I contributed a little bit to the, the conference side of things, which is probably what they're best known for. The VB conference is, is a pretty big thing in the anti-malware industry. Um, and that was that was always fun. I, I never really had to work on it very hard. They had a, like a team of, of people, most of whom are still, still there, still helping run the conference. But as a uh, you know, member, member of the team, I got to tag along and... There's nothing uh, gets you a hotel room upgrade more than bringing a couple of hundred people and spending a couple of hundred grand on catering. Give you some, give you some really nice rooms. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And not always necessary. I mean, I, I once had, uh, I think it was in, in Dallas, I had a, a dining table for 12 people in my hotel room. And I'm like, mm, I don't know. Yes, I don't think I really need that, but okay. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I, yeah, I don't know if I don't know if world class is the right term, but uh, yes, we certainly so yeah that was a big part of what I was doing at VB so the the certification test the VB one hundred. Um, one of the major parts of it was the 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 core certification set of malware samples, which came from the wild list. Um, and we had a process. So I started there in 2006. And I think I was on my own for the first two or three years and then started hiring hiring assistants and helpers, which really helped a lot. But we, we had a very small budgets. And as I say very small team and I kind of been used to being in a much bigger company where if you need a new machine, you can say, oh, my machine is old, and they just send someone around with a fresh one. And they, oh, great. But uh, in, in, in the situation, we didn't really have that. We were in a tiny little test lab as well. It was basically a, a repurposed meeting room. It barely really had the air con to, to cope with all the machines we had stacked up in there. But, um, but yeah, a lot of the work involved was validating the samples, basically, making sure that they were malicious and actually you know valid samples that, that could be used in a test set and if we went to a vendor and said look you're missing the sample they wouldn't just turn around and go say and say ha ha that's rubbish um which was a lot of manual work because we had to kind of sit there and, and try and get them to execute figure out what we're there expected to do try and get them to do it and then say check that one's definitely good put it in next so we spent a lot of time trying to figure out ways of automating this stuff. Um, started with well, just the, the process of, of cleaning up the machines. Because you know, once you've put a piece of malware on the machine, you want to make sure it's clean again before you do anything else, because otherwise anything that comes after is going to be tainted. Um, so we had lots of different ways of doing that, but then we, we figured out that, that we built a very, very, very quick and dirty system where uh, the machines would basically boot into Linux, rewrite the, the Windows partition completely, and then boot back into Windows. Very just, just a, a um, grub config file that got dropped in to change which way it booted. Um, and then we thought, while we're doing that, we're like, oh, hang on, we're, we're in this Linux machine and we've got access to the hard drive, so we can just drop anything in there we want and pull anything off there that we want. So we put in, we have a bunch of standard 
goat files, they were called, which were like the targets for infections. This was, as I say, yeah, 2008. So one of the things that had started coming back, having been disappeared for years, were, were true viruses that would actually infect other files and then cause them to go on and infect other files if they got executed, which was actually much easier to, for us to validate than anything else because you know exactly what they're going to try and do. And if you, you don't really care about any, they might do lots of other things as well, but you don't really have to care about that because you, you can see as soon as they've infected another file, that's a naughty thing and this then your sample is therefore confirmed bad and you can use it in your test. And I think they, the, the kind of resurgence, it was something to do with Chinese file shares. That's what people used to say anyway, that the, these file infectors were kind of spreading across these huge file shares that they were using in China to share all kinds of stuff. And some of them were quite prolific. There was one called uh, Fujax, I don't know if you remember that. It was the, the panda waving joysticks virus. And it would just infect just about anything. And then it changed the icon to this little picture of a panda waving joysticks. But that was, a, that was a very basic one. It, it basically just inserted a copy of itself. So it was obvious and very simple to detect and obvious to, to pick up as a user as well because you could see the icon had changed. But some of them were more sneaky. So there were a lot of the, the polymorphic viruses which would fiddle themselves a little bit so they looked a little different every time. So we built a process to validate and replicate them at the same time. So normally with a file infector, we would, we would generate maybe a few dozen at most because it takes time and then we'd have to go through and then validate all the ones that we'd created or not really created but caused to be created by the the, the malware itself and um that would that would be in itself be a couple of days work for for one or two of us and if there were 20 or 30 of these things in each monthly set to to prepare then that was basically most of your month gone so we built this system and it basically it, it did it all for us. It would simply we would drop in the reference sample that we got from the, the wild list and then let it run and anything that changed on the machine we would take take off and then we would pick one of those at random and drop them back into the clean machine, let it cycle around and cycle around. And as soon as you've got a chain of three changed files, you know that the first one infects the second one and is therefore bad and then when you get the third one you know that the second one has been infected with infectious code and is therefore definitely it's it's a working thing so we would take this chain we would take off the top two and the bottom two and all the ones in the middle were proven validated and good to go and this we spent quite a lot of time kind of refining the process trying to get it as fast as possible it was very it was very very simple and it was the days it was still windows xp in those days so it was possible to get quite a small install i think it was 800 meg or something at our, our optimal ones that we went for i think you could get smaller than that but you didn't want to lose too much functionality and we would had a pretty basic minimal linux as well to boot into so and then we got the cycle of from from dirty back to clean down to about a minute and a half it was pretty speedy and this was not on on you know high quality fast modern hardware. This was on scavenged kit that, that someone else had thrown away basically, and we had to go around you know going on eBay to try and find obscure memory to get it a bit a little bit better things like that. But yeah, I think I'm sure I'm sure today with with SATA drives and things like that it would be way way quicker. Solid state, yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually, I've seen. Several years later, um, someone from Bitdefender gave a presentation on a similar kind of system that they use for their their uh, sample analysis, I guess, mostly. But, uh, but yeah, and they're using they have these SSDs and super fast networking and everything. And they're sort of like this, and it blasts this quickly through this stuff. Like, oh, if only I'd had that five years ago. It would have been way better. But, um, yeah. But it, it worked. It was good enough, right? So say 10 minutes cycles, you can pack a lot of those in to a, to a weekend. And uh, so we ended up, we changed our system. So instead of having a few dozen samples of each 
of these polymorphic viruses in our sample set, we went up to, I think it was 2,500 we used. And rather than them being one or two generations away from the original, they were up to 2,500 generations because we only took one from each generation. And that, it turned out, was a really serious test of some of the products because the, even though these were really quite old school and fairly basic polymorphic viruses that everyone thought, yeah, we can totally detect them. We're, we're totally fine with them. It turns out quite a few products were not quite perfect on all of them, which is exactly what the certification test is meant to find out. But it turns out we were maybe a little too effective at finding it out. And we had several of our of the, the largest companies suddenly finding themselves not passing the certification. I think one of them had, had we were just about to celebrate 10 years of passing every month or every every other month, however often we ran it. And then suddenly we were like, um, excuse me, uh, it seems to be a small problem here. And uh, yeah, not everyone took it very well. A lot of them were like, this is nonsense. What are you talking about? It's not possible. How can you even say that? And, we, and then we had to go and prove it, right? So it's not good enough just to say, this wire at 26, you're not quite getting it fully. We have to show them that. But we had a policy that we would never give the samples that we used in our test set to vendors because they could simply fix that one sample. Yeah. So then we would have to take the one that they'd missed and feed it back through the system and then churn out more until we found another one that they didn't detect. And quite often, in fact, I think in at least four or five cases, we had to generate more than a million new samples just to find another one that was that had whatever the feature was that they weren't picking up. And in fact, in one case, we churned out a million and we found one they didn't detect. They, we sent it over and they looked at it and we're like, oh my God, yes, we totally see it now. We'll fix it. Send over the fix and say, okay, check it now. And I'm like, okay, yeah, no, that detects the one we sent you, but not the original one. So we have to do another million or so and find another one so it was uh we basically made a lot of work for ourselves and didn't really make a lot of friends but i think basically the 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 point of it is that it's kind of what what i do now is all about really amso is the importance of these small independent testing labs because if you're you know making a product and you have a qa team in a big company, you're looking at dozens, possibly even hundreds of people working on that. But the fact that a tiny team of two guys in a tiny room with a tiny budget can find problems that they weren't finding kind of shows the the importance of that kind of approach of little people focusing on little things and kind of piercing through this huge fat armor and saying, there's a problem. I think it's very important. They weren't usually huge problems, I guess. That was the thing, that, that it's it's more... So in that case, you know, it's like this obscure little virus and it's one sample of it. And it's quite possible that no one else ever saw a sample that had those characteristics anywhere in the world. And if they did, they may have had a different product that actually did detect it. So it may not have got through. But, but, um, but yeah, no, we did regularly, you know, we found... And that's, the idea of the test was it's supposed to be easy. Right, everyone has the samples ahead of time. It's like you know, you've already got a copy of the exam paper before you go and sit down. You expect it to pass. That's that's the kind of point. But you'd still, yeah, we would find people that were were, were missing things, and uh, and then on the flip side, also that was the the main reason that people didn't get the certification was for false positives. So that was another area where we worked on a lot was just trying to harvest as much stuff as we could like of. of legitimate clean software and then seeing if anybody picked up any of that and that was also a source of lots and lots of arguments as well because people would be like this is pretty obscure this is like a 
weird Russian notepad executable that has only ever been seen on two machines in the world. And you're playing, yeah, okay, maybe that's not significant enough to deny certification, perhaps. But so there's a kind of double thing of, of a trying to get as much stuff as possible, but also trying to make sure that it's at least reasonably meaningful, which is which can be very difficult. Like it, there's not an enormous amount of in, well, certainly back then there wasn't an enormous amount of information on you know how many people are using a given piece of software it's pretty hard to find out unless you're unless you're microsoft i guess yeah even things like the the big download sites it would say you know this thing has been downloaded 12 million times does that mean it's got 12 million users is that a lot i don't know <laughs> yeah it could be why not uh -huh. um yeah it was just, it was certainly the first two or three years i was i was literally in that room on my own and we had to keep the door locked um because you know they had very strict rules. We were, you know, we were, our, our offices were being hosted by a security company, and they were like, "We don't want your stuff coming near any of our stuff." So you know, keep well away. And they had their own, you know, pretty extreme policies for. You know, the, we were right next door to the virus lab, so the, the, the process of getting stuff in and out of the virus lab was always very pretty arduous to make sure that nothing ever got out that shouldn't do. So we had to do that, and I mean, yeah. It, but you know, I'm 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 quite happy sitting on my own for for three or four hours at a time, and and also I guess part of the benefit of having being hosted inside the, a big company, especially one where I'd I'd already worked for five years, I knew a lot of people there. So yes, going going for a smoke break or going down the cafeteria for a sandwich or something was always uh, it was kind of like yes, like like sitting at a desk and not like, keeping your headphones on and not talking to people. Really, it was the only difference. I just I just had a door. Yes. Um, well, that's 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 come out of AMSO basically. So we set up AMSO two thousand eight. Um, I well, v VB was a, a founder member, and I was very much involved right from the very beginning. Um, I sat on the board of directors for a couple of spells. Um, I was chair of the board of directors for a little while. Um, and throughout that time, that's one of the big focus of the, the organization was creating these kinds of guidelines and standards for how to test these specific areas. So like, I know back in when we were first starting out, people were just starting to use the cloud. So that your AV could, could look stuff up remotely rather than having a local database of stuff. And we were like, okay, so how, how is this going to impact testing? How do we make sure that this is properly tested? And we would get together the vendors and and the testers who were who knew the most about that kind of stuff and we would sit them in a room and basically bang their heads together until they came up with a set of guidelines that everyone could agree with which was not always easy but uh i think we did a, we did a remarkable job given that it's it's a lot of these people are are business rivals basically and not necessarily that keen on sharing all the their inside information and even on the testing side you know you, you don't want to let your fellow testing labs know that you've got a big a new idea coming out in a couple of months because they might gazump you. Um, but that's I think that's what always, AMSO has always been about, has been getting that collaboration going and saying, look, this is going to benefit you all, so you might as well contribute to it. And uh, yeah, so the IoT paper was, that's the I think it's the most recent one we published. It was only a few months ago. We did... Um, we had a, I think it was a presentation from one of our members at, uh, we do these testing town hall events. We've been doing them through the, the pandemic while the, we couldn't have in-person meetings. So we have these sort of mini conferences where we get sort of three or four people to come and give a presentation on 
something vaguely related to testing. But um, but yeah, we had this guy talking about IoT security products, and you know they're claiming to be the be all and end all, and they're going to completely protect your your premises or your whatever from from IoT based threats. Can anyone prove that, please? And we were like, oh, that's a good question. So yeah, we got together a little tiger team. We had a couple of guys, uh, well, one of the guys who was running the Avast IoT lab, um, who's now is actually branched out on his own and is on our the AMSO board of directors now. But uh, he, he basically drove the product project along because he knew all about this stuff. And um, we had an input from various testers, and we we reached out to people outside of AMSO who were kind of specializing in IoT security and it turns out it's a, it's a much bigger industry than I expected I was thinking it's going to be you know like the the standard players that you would expect you know sticking a bit of extra stuff onto a, a router or something and saying okay now you're protected but there's there's companies who are like okay if you have a hospital and you have a, a Leonardo machine that you're using to perform surgery remotely you need to be sure it's safe and we'll do that for you and you know, as as a, as a tester, my question is always, did you prove that? Um, so yeah, we basically produced this set of guidelines to say that this is things you need to look out for in when you're testing that kind of stuff. And obviously, it's a very it's a very broad area, so it's like ranging from you know, protecting your your doorbell to a nuclear power station. It's, it's quite a big difference. You're not going to hopefully you're not going to be using the same product for that. So it's it's necessarily quite broad ranging, and we try to cover as much ground as possible. But uh, and I, I I hope we will continue that project and and sort of make more kind of targeted ones for the more specific sectors to uh, come out eventually as well. Yeah, well, that's that's the the thing with actually a lot of the stuff that we talk about certainly within AMSO is aiming to be sort of non technology specific. Um, is not to say you know, okay, if you have a product of this type, this is what it should do and this is how it should work. We try to say okay, if you're going to secure something, we don't really care how you do it. We just want to see if it's effective or not, and that kind of approach tends to make it more flexible so that you can cover different kind of verticals um and that's that's very much what we focus on in the certainly in the iot paper was on securing the infrastructure rather than the actual tools themselves so we don't talk about you know is this particular type of doorbell more secure than this type of doorbell but is this product which is offering to make your doorbell secure better than this one and uh yeah, but I, I totally imagine I've seeing the size of the medical area it's and how much it's how quickly it's growing. I I can easily see that being something that we would have to do something specific about at some point because once it gets big enough you kinda have to to have something more focused. And I very much I I'm not actually aware of any testing going on in that specific area you know there there, there, are, there have been a few small tests of more general jet mostly home user iot security stuff but um it's definitely something we need to have because otherwise how how are we going to know if these things are any good yeah once all our cars start driving themselves kind of there's a lot lot to worry about there Um, the, the money stuff, I guess that was always like suddenly going from my, 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 the impact of money on my working life is, can I have this much this year, please? Yes. No. To suddenly here are 27 different things that we need to spend on here are 10 different things that we're getting money from and how do we balance that all out? And yeah. And doing that while still doing the job 
was particularly difficult, especially in this in 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 testing because you're basically saying this person is good or bad while at the same time saying this person is going to give me money or not so kind of avoiding any kind of uh inappropriateness there it was was quite difficult so we tried certainly by, by the time i was kind of managing the uh the money side at, at, at bb we pretty well separated you know the people who knew who would were paying for various services that we provided from the people who were doing the testing work because they didn't need to know. So, uh, that, but but while it was just one person, that was very difficult, obviously. So you kind of relied on your kind of personal integrity, that kind of thing. And I think that remains that remains a yeah yes. I mean, you kind of have to be beyond reproach because as soon as somebody as soon as you you do a bad thing and someone finds out about it. You can't ever do anything else because no one's going to trust you anymore. Which is another big thing that we we still have an issue with in Ampso today. We have a lot of people who don't trust testers because they say, "Well, if you're getting paid by vendors, then how can I how can I trust you're independent?" And that's another another part of what Ampso has been trying to do is to to help the testers demonstrate that they're being transparent that they're saying what they're doing, what they say they're going to do, and they're open about everything. And if somebody's giving them lots of money, they need to, to tell people that and say, okay, this test was sponsored by whoever. And, and yes, it's all about trust. It's all about fostering trust in the readership. Whoever's consuming your, your test data needs to believe you. Yeah. Be be really clever. It's always been a big one. I've, that's the thing with, with both AMSO and with VB going to conferences, and you see all these these old hands that have been there for twenty years, and they they all know everybody and they're total experts. And then you get some nineteen year old whiz kid pops up and has some amazing idea, and you're like, wow, he's smart. It's, it's quite a hard thing to aim for, I guess. But you know, if 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 you have that opportunity, you, you, you're sharp enough and you can work hard enough and you can really make a splash. It's quite impressive. <laughs> yeah, working hard. Working hard is, uh, is generally quite useful, especially in, in early days. But, uh, but yeah, and also I think getting to know people, which I know is, is not necessarily a, a top skill in the IT field, but it's it's the only way to do things. Really, you can't ever work in a vacuum. You have to work with other people, and whether those are you know colleagues on your team or you know an official rival on the other side of the world who just happens to be a bit friendly. The more people you know, the more resources you have. Basically, if you if you need to reach out in an emergency and say I'm stuck, I need some help. You, you, kind of want someone to be there to say I can help and you need to be that person yourself as well so making those networks very very important I, I think it's the same you know I still th I think it's collaboration, and I think that's even more important in in those people who are kind of at the top. Um, there is a, or there can be a tendency in some people to say, "Look, I'm I'm the king now. I don't need to help other people because uh, I don't need other people to help me." But those are exactly the people that you do want to be, you know, passing on their their wisdom and joining in things like AMPSO, any any collaborative effort across the industry needs those you know seasoned veterans just as much as it needs the the bright young whippersnappers so yeah join in collaborate pay it back, pay back all that help you got on the way up
Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, I have an enormous to do list, but it's it's mostly tiny stuff. It's like day to day. I don't I don't I'm not a big long term planner. I don't I've never had sort of five year goals or anything like that. Um, I've always uh, had this idea of at some point taking like an extended period of time off. I've had that, you know, where you'd like leave one job and then you have like six months before the next job starts, which never quite managed i don't think i've ever actually had more than a weekend gap between employments so uh, in fact it, when i started vb i kind of overlapped with my in fact both my previous jobs have overlapped with the ones before so i've not had any kind of break in between but um obviously doing that would mean leaving amsa which i don't really want to do because it's quite good and i quite like it so but maybe one day i'll, I'll get around to that but that could just be retirement so i the, the gap between yeah but that's that's kind of not the point though isn't it really you, you, the, the idea was to do it before then while you're still uh and decide if you want to go back or not i was a, i was talking to one of the um one of the serious big wigs who uh recently sold his company and retired and went home and decided he wanted to take up cooking and after three weeks his wife was like get out of my kitchen so now he's he set up a new company and is back working again. So he had uh, had almost a month. Well, yeah, exactly. But I think that's the, that's kind of the point of it, really, isn't it? Is that you have to take that time to figure out what it is you want to do. And I think that's probably why I've never had this any kind of long term plans, is because I've never had enough time to think about them or to get to that position where I'm like. I've got nothing to do. What should I do? As opposed to, I've got nothing to do. Oh, thank God. Oh, mm hmm. Mm hmm. I guess not completely different, but I would probably have focused more on the writing side. Because I do enjoy that, and I nowadays barely do much of it at all, really. But um, back when I was doing it properly, like a couple of days a week, that was that was quite enjoyable. I quite like that, and I imagine I would like to have done more of it. I guess, but I probably, I probably, hopefully, I will do at some point. But uh, yes, or that, or become a professional footballer. But I, I think I gave that one idea up about 17. So. <laughs> no worries. It's been fun. Well, check out the AMSO website, amtso.org. It's all there. We've, we've just done a, a big uh, relaunch, rebranding. It's all beautiful and shiny these days. And uh, yeah, or drop me a line. John at amtso.org will reach me. I'm very friendly on the emails. I don't know. I think I'm all good. 